In this hour, we're going to be talking about films and uh, series on ITV and on Netflix. We're going to be talking about D-Trans Awareness. And we'll be looking at the work of Jack Kerouac, who was born 100 years ago, author of On the Road. But first, 1066 is the best-known date in English medieval history because of the Norman Conquest. The Normans quickly overran England and replaced the country's rulers, but struggled to subdue Wales. Normans also enjoyed great military and political success in southern Italy and as part of the First Crusade, acquiring the Principality of Antioch, which covers an area of present-day Turkey and Syria. How the Normans were able to spread their conquests and influence so widely is re-examined in a new book, The Normans, Power, Conquest and Culture in 11th Century Europe. The author is Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Edinburgh. Judith A. Green joins me now. Welcome to Times Radio. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Um, it seems, from reading your book, that you felt that a reappraisal of the Normans was called for. Why? Why? I think you've already touched on the fact that we're very familiar with the date 1066 and we're very familiar with those images from the Bayer tapestry, which is almost used for a shorthand without explanation in newspapers. Great warriors on their huge horses, the storming Normans. And I want to explore their experiences behind these images and also to see what the nature of their impact was on different regions of Europe. Um, but with some feeling that that had been misunderstood in the past? I think we've been tempted into believing the myths the Normans told about themselves, that they were super warriors, unstoppable, um, really never had an off day. And they, as winners, they wrote the history in this period or they commissioned the history in this period. So I wanted to, to try and look behind that, not in any sense saying that reality was necessarily fundamentally different from myth because myth helps to create reality, but seeing how the two interact. Mm. People join your football team because they think you're a winner, you're going to be a winning team. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the image is very, very important. Yeah. Now, um, we, um, rather locally, we think of them as coming from Normandy and we think we know where Normandy is. <clears throat> but what do we know of their origins in the slightly longer term? Where had these Normans arrived from? They are Norsemen. They are Vikings. And they come from a settlement led by a man called Rollo, Rolfer, I guess, in, in uh, Old Norse, and, and his followers who were granted land by the King of the West Franks in the early 10th century to defend the Seine Valley from other Vikings. Essentially, the king thought that Rollo was a Viking with whom he could do business, so he gave him land. And within a century, they had taken over other independent groups of Vikings and had created a very powerful, cohesive duchy. Mm. And they called themselves dupes by that time as well. Um, now we're going to look at some of the places that they went, and uh, actually not in chronological order, but they went to southern Italy, um, why? What, what, what was the impulse to go to southern Italy? Paymasters. They were young men who were fighting for honour, glory, wealth, hopefully, land, the girl, the rest of it. And in southern Italy, there were paymasters in plenty. It was a highly contested region between the eastern emperors, the western emperors, local Lombard lords. And they knew all this. We tend to think that people lived in their own villages in the Middle Ages, but of course, people were going backwards and forwards, particularly pilgrims. And the links between Southern Italy and the shrine of St. Michael on Monte Gargano and Normandy and the great shrine at Mont Saint-Michel meant that the Normans were very interested in, in going to Italy. So there's the people going backwards and forwards. So they knew what the opportunities were. But then what I haven't quite understood is if there were paymasters who said, for example, come and have a battle in Sicily and let's throw Muslims out, how was it that the Normans themselves, rather than their paymasters, became those who conquered and ruled? Yeah, well, this was, I think, the central question which I've been mulling over for many years. Why the Normans? Because 
it's quite clear when you read the, the legends and the stories that they enroll Flemings, Bretons, Slavs, Muslims, um, and they're all under the heading of Normans. So a lot of it is down to timing and luck and where they're fighting, but most of all, I think it's, it's, it's leadership, it's charismatic leadership. And we tend to underestimate this, or we think in, in terms of old style heroes and, and kings and battles. But I think these were exceptional men, utterly ruthless and determined. And they fought um, and were determined to win. Um, was it the same motivation that took them on the first crusade or was piety also one of their motives? Piety was certainly one of their motives. I, I think this is obviously one of the most debated subjects of all, uh, what were they aiming to do? And I think some of them, particularly Duke Robert of Normandy, genuinely thought he was going on an armed pilgrimage and he went and he helped to liberate Jerusalem and then he went back again. Um, others like Beaumont, who is, is the other larger than life Norman on the first crusade, was basically out for what he could get. Um, he dramatically takes the cross when, just by coincidence, uh, there is a, a useful army besieging Amalfi and he puts a red cross on his shoulder and all the other knights think, right, we're up for this. And they all go, but Bohemond knew very well that there were opportunities in the Byzantine Empire, which is where his father had been trying to establish himself. And I think Bohemond was the arch opportunist. So it's very mixed. People went for different reasons. Now, we've not been chronological because the First Crusade is at the end of the 11th century and um, England was uh, invaded in 1066. Now, in what ways was the conquest of England, and for that matter Wales, different from other Norman ventures? It's the numbers involved. It, you don't have to argue sort of English exceptionalism, but there's no doubt there were far more Normans and they were led by the Duke himself. This wasn't bands of mercenary soldiers fighting for whoever would pay them. This is a very powerful group. William's inner military band, if you like, that he'd, he built up over decades. These were men who would fight for him. And it was, it was very convenient timing from his point of view, sufficiently secure in Normandy to be able to go. And he knew that if he didn't go, Harold Hardrada was, was on the horizon. He was going to invade and possibly Flemings as well. Um, and another difference, I think, that you bring out is that William the Conqueror really thought, or at least certainly really claimed, that he was entitled to the crown of England. Yes, he did. Um, he, he, he was entitled, and this is how he had justified the conquest of Maine a few years earlier, which in many ways was preparation for the invasion of England. I mean, he, he was by no means the best candidate for the English throne in 1066, but he jolly well felt that this was his for the taking. Mm. And England was changed thoroughly by Norman rules. That, that's, that's not part of your revision, is it? I mean, we, we were thoroughly taken over and all the key positions were replaced by Normans, were they not? They were, both in church and state. Um, it, it becomes less intense the further away you get from the south of England. So on the Welsh marches and in Wales, there are fewer Normans. And in the north of England, north of York, there are fewer Normans in the 11th century. Um, but yes, they, there was almost a complete re replacement. And systematically, the bishops and abbots, as they died, were replaced by uh, Normans. And not only that, but the, the whole landscape changed because all major churches just about were pulled down and rebuilt on an immense scale, actually bigger than anything built in Normandy. And of course, castles proliferated. So, so you didn't have to go very far to see that the Normans were making a mark on the landscape. Um, when we began this conversation, you said to some extent you were challenging the myth that the Normans had been immensely successful and had never had an off day. I think that was your, yes. your, uh, your, your slang. But the more you've talked to me, the more you make me think that the myth is absolutely right. They were very successful and they may have had one or two off days, but not very many. They did very well, didn't they? 
They did, they did do exceptionally well. And that's why I was careful to say that I'm not throwing the myth out uh, mm. altogether. But I think, uh, for example, the, the narratives written at the time, if you start pick, unpicking them, you find that William the Conqueror, for example, was never so successful in his later years. And actually, in the last battle he fought against his eldest son, his eldest son managed to biff him over the head. And, uh, you know, they don't tell you... Uh, Bowman's career ended in failure. First of all, he was captured and then he was ransomed. Um, and then he went back to Italy and tries to raise more funds for the crusade, but actually dies. And it's Tancred who builds the principality of Antioch, not Bowman. So, so you have to sort of see the careers in the round, I think. It's a very readable book. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. The Normans, Power, Conquest and Culture in 11th Century Europe. The author is Judith A. Green. Thank you so much for joining me on Times Radio. Pleasure. This is Times Radio and this is Michael Portillo.